It is three o'clock and uh, we are excited to uh, kick off a, an inaugural series of conversations related to uh, the future and a concept that is near and dear to my heart as you heard Dr. Burgess say theological formation and uh, the, the values, the characteristics, the components that make up theological formation. And so uh, we are uh, excited to have a wonderful panel of uh, practitioners, researchers, and uh, more importantly, friends who are, um, I called at a moment's notice and said, uh, can you come? And they all said, absolutely. And so I am really pleased to have um, three uh, partners to kick off this, this inaugural series here. Forming Tomorrow's Clergy, uh, the, the main title of this actually comes from my doctoral project thesis. Uh, the, the subset then was Forming Tomorrow's Clergy, uh, developing a formative-based uh, formation pro program for clergy. But I decided to keep with that theme because uh, there's always a tomorrow. And there's always the, the opportunity to continue to form folks for whatever the tomorrow is. And so what I want us to uh, hear today is we're, we're going to begin this conversation of exploring uh, the ecology of formation. And we'll, you'll hear more about the, the metaphor of ecology as we go along. Uh, and what does it mean to form people for ministries that are, as in our mission statement says, yet to be uh, uh, created? So I'm excited to have three folks. Uh, first is Dr. Matt Bloom, who is the director of the Work Well program at the University of Notre Dame. He, for 25 years, as you've seen in, in his bio, he's been a professor. I think he's decided to, you know, do a lot of different things. Formation happens to all of us, right? A vocational clarity happens to all of us. Uh, I met Matt, uh, oh wow, 15 years ago or more, uh, when he was just noodling an idea about the uniqueness of clergy and the way in which uh, clergy are formed for a job that has, if we were to write all of the duties of a pastor, all of the duties of a clerical leader, would number in the tens and twelve single space pages. And so how do you form somebody for that kind of job? And as a researcher on the social science side doing uh, management uh, uh, professorship uh, and, and teaching, um, it was a curiosity, and I've just been excited over the years as I worked with Lilly programs and he worked with Lilly programs to hear him over and over again as he learned a little more and expressed a little more. And uh, I, I just think he's an essential partner to, to help us to, to know that. So let's welcome Matt Bloom um, here. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, again, as of my work is with uh, Lilly, uh, uh, was able to uh, be introduced to, uh, at that time, was a consultant, I think, um, uh, uh, with the Wabash Pastoral Leadership Program, the Reverend Libby Davis Manning, who is now the director of the Wabash uh, Pastoral Leadership Program. She'll say a bit more about what the, the, the leadership program is, but I've come to know uh, Libby as a, as a wonderful uh, and gentle um, uh, provocateur. <laughs> uh, who works with specifically pastoral leaders who are out, out of seminary, right? Folks who are seven to 10 to 15 years uh, out of seminary where the ecology, as you heard, the seedbed is rich and everything is wonderful and you can get the rhythm because there's a rhythm to chapel, and, right? Seven years out of seminary, you've got to figure all that stuff out on your own. And so Libby works at that intersection of what does it mean to continue to be formed and to make yourself continually available here. And so uh, I'm excited to have uh, Libby come from uh, Indiana, where the Wabash uh, Center is, is based, the leadership program is based, and to come and reflect uh, from her work with those pastoral leaders. So let's welcome uh, Reverend Davis Manning. Thanks. And then last, we have the Reverend Dr. Joseph W. Daniels, Jr., who by technicality is a Pittsburgh native in that you were born here, yeah. right? And, ha and family is still here, uh, but has for the last over, what, 25 years almost now? Started my 30th year. 30 years. 
pastored the Emory Fellowship Church of Washington, D.C. Uh, I won't tell his story or steal his thunder, but I will say that uh, uh, Pastor Daniels and the Emory Fellowship Church is doing the most innovative ministry in Washington, D.C. right now today uh, at the intersection of, of uh, uh, urban ministry and uh, urban renewal and affordable housing. Uh, and many, many of the uh, experiments that are currently happening in Pittsburgh, uh, Joe Daniels has been doing uh, in, in Washington, D.C. And he's a pastor. He has a pastor's heart. He, has a, he uh, was a Baptist and then went to the Methodist side. God bless you. <laughs> and was a Presbyterian for a period of time as well, <laughs> as the Methodist bishop claps in the back. Uh, <laughs> um, but... but uh, has taken uh, John Wesley's principle of uh, the world being my parish uh, to heart. And, and, and so he's going to tell us what churches need to be thinking about. How do they participate in these formative ecologies? So let's welcome uh, Pastor Daniels. So the way this is going to uh, uh, happen is a bit of a modified TED talk. So uh, uh, each Matt and Libby and Joe will present for a few minutes and kind of uh, hold the floor. I encourage you to, to take notes and, and be front loading your questions. And then we are gonna have fun up here while you watch. <laughs> so once, once they've spoken, then we're gonna do sort of a fishbowl and kind of dialogue, which hopefully will be generative for you to further expound upon that. And then we'll open up the floor for a few moments for you to, to ask questions of them as a part of this dialogue together. And then I'll come back and, and, and close us out with where the arc of these conversations are really uh, designed to go. So with that, we'll begin with Matt. Okay, that's fine. And the slides will be here, and we'll, when will they see them? Okay. Yeah. I can't talk without slides. There we go. Well, it's just an uh, amazing privilege to be here and uh, participate in this inaugural. It's so great to see Asa and just commend the board of directors, the faculty, the staff, and the students. You've made such a wise choice. I'm d delighted that I get to share with you a little bit about what we have learned, my team and I, from 25 years of studying clergy. And what does it mean to flourish? What does it look like for a pastor to flourish? And what are some of the factors that are essential for that kind of flourishing? And of course, we have to look at its counterpart. What does it look like for a pastor to languish in ministry? And what are some of the causes of that languishing? I want to start by framing this with an insight that popped up very, very early in our research, a conclusion that we have since confirmed, con confirmed and that we're exploring even more deeply. And it's something that I call trajectories of well-being. You'll have to excuse the kind of cumbersome research language. But what it means is that we found that very early in ministry, something happens that affects clergy well-being for many, many years in the future. There is a certain group of pastors that I'm going to say have a good start and they are on a trajectory of lifelong flourishing. They have ups and downs like we all do, and they sometimes have extended periods of difficulty, but unless a catastrophe happens, they return to flourishing, and even if a catastrophe happens, many of those pastors return back to flourishing. And then there's a second group that gets what I'm gonna call a bad start, and they are on a trajectory of lifelong struggle. In this group are these pastors who move from church to church to church, and things just never seem to go right in that church, or the pastors who experience significant physical and mental health challenges. And this is a group in which we find many pastors who have fallen to some sort of misconduct. And so what that told us is there is something really important about a good start. And so we first wanted to know, well, where does a good start happen? What are the critical places in which this good start happens? And what we find is that it happens in two places, seminary and a pastor's first church appointment or call. Now what this means is that seminary and first call, after that a pastor, unless something significant happens, a pastor is on a trajectory already. And that means seminary and first calls are fundamentally important 
for the long term of pastor flourishing. And so the two essentials that I want to share go to what happens in seminary. What do we think that happens in seminary that's very essential for flourishing? And one of them I'll have a bit to say about, and the second one I'll have not very much to say about, because that will be more your domain. So the first essential is that pastors who flourish emerge from seminary with an authentic pastoral identity. And we're finding more and more this is the root, this is the foundation for lifelong flourishing. It is essential. And pastors who have an authentic identity, as I mentioned, and I'll mention in a minute, seem to have all of the things they need to adapt and grow and to meet challenges in a way that's generative for them and for their congregations. So when, as a researcher, I'm a social psychologist, and in the social sciences, the leading model of what an identity is, we need to think about what an identity is, is it's certainly our self-concept, the ways we understand ourselves. And what we find, though, neuroscience and social science tells us that really the way an identity forms in our brains is through a lifelong narrative. Starting in adolescence, when our brains are capable of it, we start to write or author a life story in which we're one of the central characters. And so it's a living autobiography and we're writing and rewriting this all the time. You're writing some today and certainly when pivotal events in your life happen, you're adding new sections and chapters and we can go back and we can rewrite previous sections. But when we think of our identity, it's contained in this narrative. It's certain facts about ourselves, but wrapped into the narrative the autobiography we have about ourselves. And so researchers call this a narrative identity. And that's what we explore. How does an authentic narrative identity form? Well, an authentic narrative identity is one that truly represents the richness and fullness and complexity and complicatedness of who we really are. An authentic identity is one that in which our knowledge and skills, our capacities and abilities are clear and articulated. We know the things that we can do well, and we know the knowledge and skills, the capabilities and capacities that we don't have. A part of an authentic identity are those characteristics that are, that are essential to who we know we are and how we show up in the world. Our personality, our age, our race, our religiosity are all deep parts of our authentic narrative identity. And to the extent that we understand and can narrate those, we have a stronger and more authentic identity. And central to our authentic identity are the virtues and values and beliefs that shape our worldview and our self-view. And so authentic identity is one that is rich in understandings of these things. Both are better nature, the better angels of our nature, and our darker side, our strengths and our weaknesses. And these, I, these authentic identities then are built over time. Unfortunately, it's the belief of many researchers that our culture doesn't offer many of us opportunities to author the kinds of identities that are most generative for us over the lifetime. Some of it's because we don't have opportunities to do the rich identity work that we need to, but it's also because our culture constrains individuals. Women and people of color are constrained oftentimes in their capacity to author an identity because the culture is placing demands or threats on them in a way that forestalls their capacity to do this. So we need generative environments in which we can come to know ourselves and author this kind of an identity. So what seminary offers is an opportunity for individuals I think there's a slide missing, but that's okay. Uh, so what seminary offers is an opportunity for us to, for pastors and training, pastors and formation to author an identity. What happens when we don't have an authentic identity is we have a kind of patchwork identity. And so as we move forward in life, we're drawing on an incomplete understanding of who we are. And oftentimes then we draw on the context that we're a part of to try to figure out, well, who am I supposed to be? Mm. And so in some ways, people with a real patchwork identity are, are blown around, if you will, by the different contexts, the different demands, the different expectations that are put on them, rather than being able to operate out of this clear, authentic identity, knowing who they are. When we have an authentic identity, we can bring our best selves because we know what that best self is. And we can understand how to bring that self in a way that meets the unique challenges and opportunities of the situation. We can adapt 
adapt in ways that allow us to show up as our best self because we, can, we know who that self is and we can, if you will, improvise where we need to. We can negotiate conflict better. We understand ourselves, our feelings, our motives, and we are therefore able to meet people in a conflict in a better and more generative way. We're, we're more creative because we can draw on our, on our best selves in these contexts. So what we think happens when the pastor gets out into the first call and then the churches after that with a fragmented identity is he is constantly trying to figure out what kind of pastor he should be and can be rather than operating out of a, a deep sense of the pastor that he is. And what the research suggests is you have to craft an authentic personal identity and out of that you can craft an authentic pastoral identity. For me to craft an identity that's authentic as a professor, I need to know first who Matt Bloom fully is so I can bring forward those parts of me that are appropriate for the particular role that I'm in. And we think that seminary is the place where that can happen and absolutely needs to happen. Seminary can be a holding environment in which young seminarians can re revisit their past. Think about how did my past shape the kind of person I am? They can imagine the kind of person that they might grow to be. And so there's lots of opportunity for them to share their life story, to talk to other people, to learn more deeply about who they are. We find that pastors who emerge with an authentic identity benefit immensely from being exposed to a rich repertoire of what we call exemplars. These are a variety of pastors who are authentic in their own call. And what we find is that we imagine the kind of pastor that we could be, or in my case, professor, by looking at admirable professors and saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm like that person a little bit. I see how they can be a professor. Yes, I can learn a bit about myself. Oh, that person, yes. I see how I'm like that person. And I can learn a little bit more about myself. And I can then imagine more concretely the sort of pastor that I can be. And we need a rich repertoire of, of exemplars. One of my favorite stories is a, is a young male pastor for whom one of the most salient exemplars was a senior female pastor. She had grown up in an abusive home as he was. From her, he learned how to bring that abusive part of his identity forward in a positive way into his pastorate, into his pastoral identity. And so we think that just exposure to a variety of pastors who will share richly of their formal, of their full, complex, complicated, messy call to ministry and journey through ministry so that individuals can learn what it means to be fully them in a pastoral role. So just a rich exposure to a variety of exemplars. And, oh, here's the, the slide. We're a bit out of order. No problem. Bear with me just a minute. We also need, we also find that pastors need wise guides. I don't like to use the term mentors because it's too fraught. A wise guide is a more experienced pastor who will journey alongside of pastor in formation as he or she goes through the process of learning about who they are as a person and who, what kind of pastor they can be. And the best wise guides are the ones that share honestly about the joys and sorrows of their call to ministry, about their successes and failures in ministry, about the challenges that they faced, about the celebrations they have, and is willing to be a rich conversation partner as a young pastor begins to learn more about herself and begins to imagine the sort of pastor that she can be. So one of the things that is fundamentally important that happens in the seminary is this opportunity to develop an authentic identity and to leave into that first church with a clear sense of the unique pastor that God made you to be and how you can fulfill your pastoral call in a way that situates you firmly in the authenticity of your identity. A second thing that we think is pivotal at seminary is a theology of well-being. And this is a huge gap among many pastors. What we find in our interviews with pastors oftentimes is, a, is, a, is a, some sort of saying like this, I, am, I have a difficulty reconciling my flourishing in ministry with what I understand the Bible to say. Because after all, Jesus and most of the disciples died for their ministry. And so pastors struggle to situate their well-being, their flourishing within a context that to them it seems theologically solid. I don't know what to tell you about this, but what I know is pastors are crying out for a way of situating 
their sense of flourishing, their sense of well-being, their sense of doing well in life within the context of a theology that allows and authenticates that for them. So I think that that's something that I can't tell you much about. I don't know much about theology. I, I'm a dabbler at best in theology. I know Miroslav Volf has a book about a theology of flourishing, but I can't find a richly, articula a richly articulated theology, and particularly one that would help pastors understand that their flourishing is theologically not only important and appropriate, but something perhaps maybe that is even a part of their call to ministry. So if I said there were two things from our, two essentials that could happen at a seminary, it would be creating authentic identities that, that needs a rich ecosystem of conversation partners and exemplars and wise guides and opportunities to explore. And that includes a theology of well-being that allows pastors to situate what they know is important in some parts deeply within their spirit and their understanding of God's plan for them. Bravo. Thank you, Matt. Can I just pass it off to Yes. Them? And then what's the button? This one? You're going to what? I'm going to get you to your first slide. Cool. What does he say? He's going to get me to the first slide. Okay. And blessings upon you, Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and President Lee. As the church writ large, the host of heaven, the communion of saints, the ancestors seated around the feast of the throne, celebrate with you all on this most glorious of days. Having received the baton from Matt, I'm going to be the panelist that speaks to the evolving identity of the pastor in the local community, in the public square, as we think about formation in ministry for the 21st century. Before we move there, however, into ministry in the 21st century, I want to review where we've been as a church, as God's people. P Pittsburgh Theological Seminary's Antecedent School, founded in uh, 1794, the 19th century agrarian age, Communication was as far or as vast as a horse could travel, right? People lived on the land, the soil, the agronomy, life was what was uh, characteristic of us. That age passed and we moved into 20th century, the industrial age. In that age, the railroads connected the coasts of our countries and so communication was as broad and vast as our nation now. The assembly line was the great invention of the industrial age, and education formed in a way similar to the assembly line, and theological education did as well. In the assembly line, time and process is fixed. The same cohort of students moves through the same time frame with the same rate of classes, and then they graduate and move out, and then another group comes through and moves through. Change in the industrial era was slow enough to be manageable. It moved at a rate of incremental ones. One by one by one, and we could manage that. Now, we're in the 21st century. The industrial era has passed away. We're now in a whole new world where communication is on a global scale. Change happens on an infinitesimal exponential level <laughs> where we're no longer thinking one by one by one. We're thinking in terms of tens, 10 by 10 by 10. We're 10 times 10 times 10, we're at 1,000. Yes. And how do we manage that change? Those changes, of course, have impacted demography and economy and technology. More changes are coming. The acceleration of change is on a scale we've never, never lived through before. And of course, all of this impacts government and healthcare and the church and business and social institutions, all of which were built for a past era. This level of change has only happened once before in the Industrial Revolution, but take heart, friends. 
because the church and the long story of who we are as God's people, while our nation hasn't known this scale of change before, the church has. Our ancestors in the Acts generation knew something of change as the church was born. Our ancestors in the Reformation generation knew something of change when the church as they knew it completely morphed, transformed, the authority of the church changed. And so the question for us in this era, in this time of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary's life, how then, in light of these changes, massive changes, the scale of which we've never seen, prepare clergy and local communities for flourishing in this new ecology? Mm. I want to invite your imagination on the Aspen Grove here. And imagination is an important word to me. If you didn't get a chance to read David Brooks's uh, article in the New York Times yesterday, do so. He looks at Plato and Aristotle's understanding of imagination and says Plato's understanding is pie in the sky, luxury good, this thing of imagination. But Aristotle, he understood imagination to be the very foundation of knowledge. And this, this, this understanding of imagination is really critical to theological formation uh, in the 21st century, I believe. But I take inspiration from a forest scientist by the name of Suzanne Samard. She's from Canada, I believe, and she completely unraveled the current thinking on how forests form an ecology together. And she did an experiment where instead of um, well, let me tell you about her experiment. In her experiment, she realized and learned and changed everything about how we understand forests, that trees don't compete for resources in the forest. Trees actually share resources and nutrients and goods with one another in the interlaced root system, in the mycelium network that is subsoil, in the fungi uh, interlacing network of communication that is happening in the forest floor that we can't even see. Her point and her discovery was that it was the connections between us that matters. It was the connection between trees that matters. It's the connection between us and our churches and our institutions in the civic society, I posit, that will matter in the 21st century. Um, I say that because I direct a program called the Wabash Pastoral Leadership Program, and we put early career pastors, and by early career, I mean ordained five to 10 to 15 years, so post-seminary education, and we put them in rich conversation with local civic leaders to address the challenges that are presenting that impact life together in that ecology. And so our pastors and our civic leaders are addressing these adaptive challenges related to education and justice and hunger and poverty and um, flourishing of life in the community. And they dialogue with one another and they trust the inspiration that comes from the Holy Spirit given to us in baptism to forge an adaptive way forward that couldn't have been discovered without the conversation and the connection among them. Friends, beloveds, as you know, the challenges that are before us, the likes of which we've never seen, are so complex that not one sector of people are gonna solve them. If that were possible, some brilliant person already would have created the solution. The challenges that are before us are adaptive issues that will take multiple thoughtful, caring people committed to the well-being of the local ecology to begin to move the needle on these issues. And I posit that the Christian voice, the voice bringing the ethics and morality of, of Christian foundational faith leadership, the, the Christian voice at the table that is concerned about the lost, the least, and the last in our communities, often those populations overlooked in a, a community conversation, I posit that the Christian voice is a very important voice at these tables of conversation. And so we equip our pastors to have these conversations, uh, to learn the vocabulary around these issues, to engage, to, to come to the table as young professionals, not as, as, as student seminarians, but as young professionals, fully equal to the civic leaders at the table, 
and dream and learn and discover and learn the vocabulary of what's going on so that together new solutions can be formed. Now, I wanna tell you two stories about what our pastors are doing, but I wanna tell you the fruitfulness of this work. One, pastors are staying in communities where they serve longer. I love long pastorates. I think that's incredible fruitful work that, that the good Lord can do in a long pastorate. With, with friendships and relationships in place of pastors, with civic leaders, with other professionals, that, that burden of loneliness that is impacting so many clergy um, is less present. Pastors have a professional network of colleagues and thought leaders in their communities, and that seems to matter to the flourishing of our clergy. Secondly, our clergy are staying in the vocation of ministry longer. And beloveds, this is becoming an issue. Um, it takes a tremendous amount of dollars to educate and form a clergy for 21st century ministry. And so when that person leaves to serve a very good call, a very good place elsewhere, but outside the church, that's a, that's a loss on so many levels. So this, this we're seeing pastors are in ministry longer, staying in ministry in general, and maybe the, the greatest fruit of this is that pastors have joy along the journey. This is hard time. This is hard time. But imaginative ministry, thoughtful ministry, um, encouraging ministry, because pastors no longer feel like they're in this alone. First of all, in nowhere in scripture is that present, right? Nowhere are we called to be the, the, the lone wolves. G we're sent out two by two, um, but somehow we default to that and the burdens pile up and it's easy to become isolated. Um, and so this, this connection around us in our local ecology matters. Now, let me tell you two stories of um, some, some fruitful ministry happening in the local ecology. One of our pastors had a conversation with um, he, serving in, he is serving in the most under-resourced community in Indiana by several metrics. He had a conversation with the superintendent of the schools and the superintendent lamented that many of the graduates of the local high school had no next step into, um, into um, employment opportunities in the area. So that was creating um, non-flourishing conditions in this local community. Pastor um, then had conversations by chance with, uh, with a business leader who was lamenting that there weren't people to hire for the industry in the local community where he worked and where he wanted to hire but had some vacant places. So the pastor said, hey, let's convene a conversation among these people because we ought to be able to figure this out. They gathered together, they discussed, and what turned out was they put a curriculum together in the local high school that equipped the high school students to have the skills needed to work in the local industry so that, all those, so that those who desired could be employed after high school who wanted to work in that community. Friends, that changed the metrics, the demographics, the unemployment numbers, the morale of that local ecology. Another story, um, a pastor recognized that extreme medical debt was the number one cause of the poverty in her community. Mm. Having discovered that, she uh, called up the CEO of the hospital to see if we could have a discussion around this and some other minds on this because this is not consistent with the kingdom of God. This is not okay in her local community. Through a series of convened conversations, uh, one of the hospital administrators um, put them in touch with a medical, a not-for-profit medical debt relief agency mm. where for pennies on the dollar, medical debt could be bought. Mm. So the community leaders, the business leaders, the pastors all got together, started a campaign, and they were able to relieve over $12 million of extreme medical debt with this campaign that they, that they raised a couple hundred thousand dollars Every person in extreme medical debt in that community received a letter saying the people in your community love you and care about you and this matters to us. Wow. Wow. Changed the ecology of that place. The local pastor in conversation with the local civic leaders with the superpower of the Holy Spirit and imagination can change the ecology of a place. Yes. Um, what does this mean for Pittsburgh Theological Seminary? Uh, a couple ideas for us in the remaining two minutes I have. One is um, 
Do not worry, professors. This is not about inserting another curriculum uh, into your already full curriculum. <laughs> I posit that this kind of formation can only happen when a pastor has, um, has lived and served a church, has, has developed a pastoral identity, and has seen the human suffering on a community scale. Um, that this can only happen years past ordination. Um, and so how can Pittsburgh Theological Seminary feed into the ecology of these programs and some of these um, programs that exist already within the larger ecology? Um, they're out there. How can Pittsburgh Theological Seminary create a culture of lifelong learning? Because in this time of massive change, um, we need to be creating lifelong learners, and these programs exist, and they're out there. Um, one thing also for PTS, you will probably see President Lee out in your community quite a bit, meeting with civic leaders, talking with NGOs, talking with uh, local civic and government officials. He's stitching into the root system of Pittsburgh. He's, he's tuning into the mycelium network of this place so that together, President Lee and the local civic leaders, with the power of imagination, um, can, can tune into what God's up to in this extraordinary city. Um, it's, a, it's a joy to be with you all. I'm excited about your future together. And I share with you in closing a quote uh, that my mentor shared with me. He said, the local pastor, together with the local congregation and the local community is God's best plan for the healing of this world. And this world needs healing and this world is loved and you all are equipped and positioned to do it. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Libby, for uh, giving my secret sauce away. <laughs> 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 It is a joy to be with all of you. Um, let me click this forward, I guess. Um, uh oh, other way. The other way. Okay. You know what, Joe, Derek might need to uh, cue you up for your deck, I'm not sure. Okay. As Derek is coming, I just want, want to uh, say what a joy and privilege it is to be with all of you, how honored I am to be in the presence of my brother and friend. Uh, you have, uh, you all have just installed one of the most phenomenal, phenomenal people and one of the most phenomenal leaders on the face of the planet. Uh, Dr. Asa Lee is incredible, and uh, you will come to know that more and more and more as he seeks to indeed deepen into the ecology of Pittsburgh. He is just incredible on so many levels, and I thank God for him, for his wife, who used to serve at Emory when she was in seminary. Uh, small world and for your family and for all of you, uh, I give God thanks. Um, as Derek is, amen, as, amen. <laughs> as, as Derek is queuing this up, I would uh, just be remiss to say how it's an emotional day for me um, being with Dr. Lee, but also being back in the city of my birth. Um, my mother grew up Presbyterian and my mother grew up 10 minutes from here in the Hill District. And she grew up at Grace Presbyterian Church, of which one of your board of directors, Dr. Ronald Peters, used to pastor. And I haven't seen Dr. Peters in years, and it's great to see you, sir. Great to be in your midst. Uh, this is the city of my birth. Uh, my cousin, Dr. Barbara Gunn, is in our midst as well, uh, who is the first black female a Baptist pastor to be appointed to a Baptist church in Western Pennsylvania. And I'm here with my lovely bride of 36 years, and so I give God thanks for her. And so this is, this is home for me. My mother's still living. My mother is a retired Presbyterian pastor. Uh, and so when we talk about identity and we talk about uh, the theology of well-being, when we talk about the, the ecology of pastors in community, uh, I come from that literally uh, because grace went out into the community 
uh, when my mother and some of her sisters were just little kids. And I said, Ma, how'd you end up Presbyterian? She said, well, that was the only church that reached out to young people in the community. Wow. And wow. that's how it happened. My grandmother was uh, Pentecostal uh, on Center Avenue, uh, a Christian Tabernacle. Uh, but my mom went to Grace because Grace reached out to kids. And so I'm here, I'm the pastor. I'm the pastor as, as, <laughs> as Matt and Libby <laughs> talked about, I'm the pastor to witness to what they're saying and just to share some of uh, the story that has, that has been uh, my journey. Uh, I pastor Emory United Methodist Church in Washington, DC. I have been there for, this is now beginning my 30th year, which in United Methodism is an anomaly. Yeah, yeah. It is an anomaly. Uh, but we talk about the long-term pastorate and the benefits of that. And we talk about the first appointment, uh, which, is, which is a powerful, powerful thing. I went to Emory, um, as was told, I entered seminary as a Presbyterian. Uh, my mother, Presbyterian, my father who's deceased now, United Methodist. Uh, I left seminary as a Baptist. I almost went back to the United Methodist Church under Dr. Kane Hope Felder, who has since gone on to glory. Uh, he was going to appoint me as his associate pastor in a five in a four point charge. <laughs> and that fell apart at the last minute. Uh, and uh, I ended up visiting a cousin of mine's church uh, who was Baptist, Dr. Barber. And and um, and the, the Baptist pastor immediately put me to work <laughs> immediately. And so uh, I, I, I left the Presbyterian Church because the Presbyterian Church just wanted me to sit around, didn't want me to do anything. Baptist Church put me right in the ministry. And, I, and so I, I, I went and then I got out of the Baptist Church and the Lord said, this is not where I want you. I want you back home in one of the churches of your roots. And that's how I found myself back into United Methodism. Uh, I went to Emory. I was uh, uh, appointed to Emory. I should say I was assigned to Emory as a part time DS hire. And it's good to see my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Cynthia Moore-Cacoy, who is now the bishop in residence here in Western Pennsylvania, here in Pittsburgh. We thank God for her today too. Amen. We were colleagues on the cabinet for a little while. It's good to see her. Um, and so I, I was sent there as a, as a part-time DS hire. And I, I didn't know what part-time meant. I didn't know what part-time pastoring meant. If anybody can tell me what is a part-time pastor, y'all please help me today, okay? So when I asked the SPRC or the Staff Parish Relations Committee, what is that? They said, Oh, that means we can only pay you part time. <laughs> and so I said, does that mean that when 20 hours is up and I'm in the emergency room with somebody who's dying? I said, oh, sorry, my time is up. It's like, no, that's just all we can pay you. So I literally went to my first appointment very quickly. I went there uh, making $14,000 a year, $14,000 a year, no benefits. Thank God for my wife's good government job. Amen. Um, and we had two little kids, two little kids. But I treated the, the appointment as though um, it was the only and last appointment that I would ever have in my life. And I went there happy to pastor, excited to pastor, joy, full of joy. Uh, and that was inspired in me uh, by my parents, but also by my Uncle Pete, who lived just five minutes from here, five minutes up here in Stanton, Stanton Heights. My Uncle Pete told me before I went to Emory, he said, son, I need to tell you something. I said, what's that? He said, I want you to know that you need to go to that church and you need to pastor it like it's the last church you're ever going to pastor. And you need to pastor it um, in a way that you make it better than when you came. I went to Emory and Emory uh, was part time pastorate. Emory also uh, was on the verge of fighting to stay open. It had almost closed on three occasions and was almost sold on two other occasions. Uh, and when I uh, showed up there, um, the only thing keeping us open was the rent from the private Afrocentric school across the street. Thank God for that $2,400 or we would have closed the doors again. And so really I discovered that I was sent out of seminary to this church to conduct a funeral. But God had another plan and God brought about a resurrection. And, and so um, I, I want to just say to us as a seminary that, that, that as Matt talks about identity, that's very important, and as Matt talks about the theology of well-being, that's very important, and as Libby talks about 
really investing in uh, congregation and community. These, these, are, these are critical to the formation of people like me who serve and people like some of you in the audience who serve because we, these are the foundations that we need in order to, to flourish and thrive in a society and community where pastoring this day and time is a joy, but pastoring is very, very demanding work, yeah, yeah. very hard work. Uh, my, my pastor in seminary said to me, you are either called or you are crazy. <laughs> and sometimes you are a little bit of both. And so I, I just want to emphasize that. Um, this is the church where I serve. Again, this is, this is Emory United Methodist Church. When I first got there, okay, the grass was cut. The grass hadn't been cut for six years the first time I got there, okay? There were bottles and beer cans and used syringes and used condoms all around the church and in the stairwell. There were people who were homeless who slept on the front front steps and all up and down. This is Georgia Avenue Northwest, the major north and south corridor going in and out of the city. This is the reality that, that, that a lot of our students coming out of seminary and into the world face. We don't always come to the nice pristine chapel. Some of us do. Most of us though, whether it be rural, suburban, or urban, we go to the trenches. We go to the trenches and so identity becomes extremely, extremely important because if we don't have that, if we're not grounded in our faith and grounded in our call and grounded in who we are and have experienced those types of courses and, and experiences in seminary, we're, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Uh, I ran out, I ran out of, of things that I knew to lead my congregation seven years after getting to Emory. At seven years, I reached a, a, a wall where I felt like I had given the, the people all that I had to give. And if it weren't for my ability, thanks be to God, to listen to the ecology that was going on around me, that had a broader spiritual formation out there for me to learn, I would not have made it. I'd have been done. And, and, and that's, that's one of the things I want to share with the seminary today is, is, is that you have the opportunity to not only ground people like me in biblical studies and theological studies, which thank be to God for my biblical study work and my theological study work and my ethics work. Thanks be to God for this and my language work in Greek. Praise God for all of that. You, you not only have that responsibility to ground us in that, but you've got the opportunity to ground us in those things that can keep us whole, that can keep us whole and that then can equip us for what's really going on in this broader society that we end up pastoring. Because people in the pews are really not concerned about Bultman and Tillich and, and folk like that. They're like, huh? But what they are concerned about is, can you translate that for me in finding me a job, in feeding my family, in creating opportunity for me, in, in helping me get health insurance, in helping me do the things that are necessary in order for me to be able to live life and live it to the full like Jesus said I could. All right. And so it's a wonderful opportunity. Let me just continue with a few things. And so so um, one of the, one of the things that, that I believe the seedbed has the opportunity to to really ground and teach pastors on is, is about vision. Oftentimes we we just kind of gloss vision and call uh, when when our students come to seminary. We are often wrestling with call. We are often not clear about call. We think we have heard call. We think we know call, but we're wrestling. And vision, we're like, vision, what's that? Or we, we leave seminary thinking we have our own vision. When, when we need to learn what vision and call is all about. I, I leave this, this diagram for you. It's been very, very powerful for me and very, very powerful for, for my teaching of seminarians who, who we teach many seminarians at Emory. Our, our church, thanks be to God, has been a teaching ground for seminarians. Uh, for the last 20 years. And uh, we encourage them to come to see our greatness, to see our goodness, to see our badness, yeah. 
mm-hmm. and to see our triflingness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because we are great, good, bad, and trifling. Okay? And we let our seminarians see all of that. We let them see our faults, our failures, our joys, and our successes. All right? Uh, but it's very important that, that we help people help our leaders, our pastors, center into their purpose, their identity, okay? Uh, a, great, a great friend of mine said to me one day, can you articulate your purpose in six words? Mm. Why does God have you there? Oh, wow. And I, I thought about that thing, I was like, wow. And I said, can I come up with more six word sentences than just one? He said, just one. And I, as, as I dwelt on it, I realized that I help broken people become whole. And as I sat with it even more, and reflected over, over my time, I realized that I bring life to dead situations. And those have become the anchor for my, my purpose. And as we help leaders, help our clergy begin to rest in that, that is significant for what God wants to do in the first appointment and, and perhaps the appointments beyond. We, got, we have the opportunity to teach our people to do one-on-one relational meetings in congregation and community to get out like Jesus did, to really get to know people, to have coffee with folks, to, to have dinner with people, to understand that, that ministry really is in the street getting to know people one-on-one. And, and then we have an opportunity to hear the community's voice, because if we hear the community's voice, then we know what people in the street are talking about. And as we help our students get out into the ecology, into the civic arena to learn from what's really going on that impacts their lives every day, then all of a sudden in this sweet spot in the middle of these three concentric circles, vision shows up. And then all of a sudden, together, we can go and go after something great. Just a few more things and then I'll take my seat. And so I wanna emphasize, and Libby just kinda emphasized this, I wanna drill down a little deeper. And this is not to replace (laughs) professors or, 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 or curriculum or whatever. But what is essential in the addition to the curriculum is a deep educational opportunity we have to teach our clergy about the three sectors that make up any and every community, whether it be rural, suburban, or urban. And that is a private sector, government sector, and public sector. And how the church needs to play in that because the church is already in that. But as the church begins to organize itself within the private sector, government sector, and public sector, as the seminary begins to play and interact and share and partner with the private sector, government sector, and public sector, then all of a sudden, tremendous transformational transformational change in the name of Jesus can, can happen. Because then we begin equipping our leaders to not only deal with realities in the church, but realities in the community because I really believe that our community is our congregation. And as we settle in that, as we organize, as we meet, as we even like Jesus did leverage influence, then we can bring about changes in people's lives that will cause people to to flock back to the church and not to leave the church. I wanna show you how this this has happened in in our setting and then I'll take my seat. Uh, we, we, in our prayers and our study uh, uh, over, over the last several years in particular, came to a vision where we, we said, you know what? God is calling us to lead people to whole lives. And, and, and I began to do a study personally on, on wholeness. And I went to the word sozo, sozo in the Greek. I, I don't know if there's a Greek professor in the room today, but sozo in the Greek means to be healed, to be made complete, to be made whole. It's where the word salvation comes from. And so I, 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 God began messing with me. I was like, well, if God has called us to offer people salvation, then one of the things I believe the church has the opportunity to do is to not cheapen the word salvation, but broaden it. Because so often we've limited salvation just to Sunday morning and somebody giving their life to Christ or someone in the fellowship saying, I want to belong to the church. It's so much more than that. And so whole became an acronym for our church. The W stood for well, physically. H, heal, emotionally. O, obedient, spiritually. L, love, unconditionally. E, empowered, financially. 
And all of a sudden, we began to see that salvation is a holistic process of physical, emotional, mental, uh, spiritual, relational, and financial realities. And so the seminary, the seedbed, has the opportunity to train pastors in helping people be well physically and healed emotionally, and obedient spiritually, and loved unconditionally, and empowered financially. We have the opportunity to help people and leaders in the seminary and the community to live whole lives. There is nothing more important today if the pandemic didn't teach us anything. There's nothing more important today than somebody living a whole life. And we have the words of eternal life, a whole life. This is how this played out for us. Um, we, we just built the Beacon Center a couple of years ago, two years ago, in fact. Um, for us, when we began to look at whole, and for us, when we began to look at the civic and the identity and the well-being, we kept hearing when we went to those three concentric circles and we started doing the one-on-one -on -one meetings in congregation and community, we kept hearing the theme of, we don't have an affordable place to live. We need an affordable place to live. We need afford we don't have a place to live. We're being priced out of the city, District of Columbia, where I serve as the most gentrified city in America. People being priced out. And so we were like, well, what do we, what do, we do about it? And we took our own property and we began to connect with private sector, government sector, public sector leaders. How could we partner with them to address this issue of affordable housing and homelessness in the District of Columbia? This is what we did. I hope it comes up. There, we go. there it is. It has volume to it, and it usually goes to uh, Dave Brubeck's take six, take five, excuse me. But this, this is what we did. So you saw, you saw the church as it used to be, right? And there the church is in the middle. And what we did was to take our grounds. And one of our members said, why don't we just build here? We never thought about it. But lo and behold, when we did a survey, we realized that we could build up. We had air rights, 144,000 square feet. And so by the way, amen. Praise God. By the way, our congregation is 400 people, working class congregation, predominantly black, from 20, 20 different nationalities around the world. And this working class congregation of 400 said, you know what? God is calling us to build what would become a $58 million project. We don't have $58 million. Our folks are literally just trying to make it. But they saw that there was a greater need to reach the needs of people in our community. And we built a 99 unit fully affordable housing project right on the grounds of our church. There's a church in the middle surrounded by 99 units of affordable rental housing, three bedroom, two bedroom one bedroom and studios, luxury apartments for people who make $70,000 as a family or less. Now in Pittsburgh, $70,000 may seem like a whole lot of money. In DC, $70,000 a year is low income. The average median income in the District of Columbia today is $120,000 a year. The average median income for a white family of four in the District of Columbia is $120,000 a year. The average median income for a Latino family of four in the District of Columbia is $41,000 a year. The average median income for an African-American family of four in the District of Columbia is $38,000 a year. There is an $80,000 a year wealth gap in the District of Columbia that the people we serve in our neighborhood deal with every day. 
And so if I am going to be relevant coming out of a seminary that has been the seedbed for me to transform lives, I've got to be able to be equipped such to where I can lead and be a part and partner with people who dream like this, vision like this, and want to change lives like this. And so thanks be to God for this opportunity. It's great to be with a uh, panel and with my brother. I get excited about this stuff, forgive me. Um, but amen. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Joe. Uh, we're going to, as I said, uh, have a little fun for a minute, then we'll open the floor. Uh, I want to start with Matt. Um, you know, what are sort of the characteristics, and, and please, you all jump in as well, um, uh, uh, but I, I felt that this is an important uh, question. What, what are the characteristics? That, um, that kind of foster that authentic identity, right? Because what comes to mind when you say pat the, the patchwork identity is um, not sort of the, the blowing in the wind, but more sort of, a, sort of affinity groups, right? We, we, la we latch in to a group and, you know, in this ide ideologically sort of very divided community, we pick and choose that community that will affirm us in the identity we say we want to have. So what, what are the characteristics that, um, particularly in a seminary environment, that, that can foster sort of creation of a, a more authentic narrative? Uh, well, that's a wonderful question. Uh, um, and all I can give you is an incomplete answer. I think a lot of it happens in an opportunity to have very honest and real conversations with other people that are having honest and real conversations with you about their background, about who they think they are, about who they want to be, and being able to say things about yourself that might otherwise be censored out. And so this is why we think it's particularly difficult in many environments for women and people of color because they can't bring some of their history forward. They're not allowed to talk about certain kinds of things. Um, many of our pastors who went through clinical pastoral education point to that as a pivotal place because then they were also challenged to speak more deeply about why they responded in certain ways or why they think in certain ways. And so I think there is a kind of safe way that people can be pushed to articulate more clearly. What do you, well, what do you mean by that? And why, why do you think that way? And I think many of these conversations happen kind of around the edges, in the hallways, with the professor in her office, around a meal. Something that happens in the classroom can stimulate these things. So just encouraging that kind of an organic approach. And Asa, that's just a paltry answer, but <laughs> top of my head. Uh, that's helpful because it kind of, um, it leads me to sort of a question for all three of us, four of us, to wrestle with and feel like answering in your own way. The commonality I hope that you heard here, uh, which I think faculty members will appreciate, is we've noticed, like most seminaries, the trend of young or, or students coming discerning not parish-based ministry, but alternatives to, to that kind of ministry. And many of the adjudicatory leaders here share the same concern. Graduates come and say, well, I don't want to serve a church. I want to, right? But all three of you talked about the power and impact of social change through congregational ministry. And so I'm struck by that there are values that those alternative ministries carry, right? I'm not, I'm not deriding alternative ministries. I'm saying the values that make those alternative ministries uh, viable and meaningful are, are really connected with these very concepts that you're talking about that are often refined in congregational ministries. Yeah. Is that a fair sort of... Uh, That's fair. Can uh, I respond yes. to that? Um, the, the church is the hope for the world, Asa. And our, our seminarians come to seminary wanting to live a life of response to that truth. It's, there's so much change ab abreast and so many things in flux that there's a scariness to going into parish ministry because they don't know if the seminary is there to support them once they get off the, the assembly line. So my dream is that we could put some sort of mechanisms in place that listen to what the pastor needs in this time of wild fluctuation, because pastors are brilliant. They know what they need. They're reading the landscape. They're brilliantly trained because they've come from your institutions. They know what they need. 
how can we develop a feedback mechanism so the seminary hears what they need, sort of programs something to that, because just as the assembly line shaped education in, in the 19th century, uh, the Amazonification of education is happening now, where we want classes when we want it in real time as we need it. We want things unbundled. I don't want to buy the whole album, Asa. I want to buy a song. I don't want to buy the whole newspaper. I want to buy an article. Mm. How can we unbundle the MDivs and the STM degrees so that we can have a class that's needed in real time to meet the issues that pastors know they face um, because of the changes that are all around us? And, and how can that be embedded in, in, into seminary, seminary uh, curriculum? Yeah. Because uh, there is a disconnect when you get out and you're in the field. I didn't learn this in seminary. How, nobody taught me this in seminary. And I, I, I teach, I'm an adjunct professor at Wesley Seminary, and I, I seek to teach classes that teach the very fact that the church is the catalyst for community transformation and that students, whether they be clergy preparing for the local church or that whether they be preparing for parachurch ministry, whatever, you are the revitalizing individual that can bring change to this entire situation. But the opportunity to just to hammer home what you're saying, Libby, the opportunity to, ex, to expand a curriculum or, or, or revision a curriculum that can, that can use the best of what we do in the seminary, but build on it in a way that teaches people uh, business, finances, how to uh, deal in the public sphere, uh, in areas of which they need the tools to function, but don't have the tools to function. Um, if we can build that in a seminary setting, incredible things can happen. I'm curious as to were there things that you learned from each other in this in this presentation and, and questions? Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, I've, I've I've known Libby for quite a while and even heard new things today. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna just listening to Mike or Joe talk. Gosh, and so that's that six word purpose. That is such a marvelous practice. If those kinds of things are offered to people, because to, then it sharpens their sense of yeah what. I have a thousand words to talk about my call. What do I really mean by it? I think that, that alone, would, a takeaway like that from his was powerful because it does cause us to think deeply about what we mean. And then the two six word <laughs> purposes that you articulated are just wonderful examples of the kinds of things that are generative, life-giving, inspirational going forward. Uh, this, you mentioned this, I just want to hear a lot more about your mom's story. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, how, uh, the challenges that she faced, how she experienced. So, yes, there's many things I'd love to hear. Yeah, I was reminded that there is such life in turning outward. And so the church um, yes. and this, uh, this 99 unit uh, housing, which is possible, it's just life giving and encouraging. That's just. Praise God. I'll, I'll share this story with, uh, uh, I shared it with you two, I think. I'll share it with uh, the rest of you all. Um, the program that, that Libby runs, I ran the Wesley version of that program. And Joe was our pastor. He, we would bring our clergy folks to Joe's, Joe's church every year. And it was, I guess we started coming as the building started coming up, right? Before. Yeah, before we yeah, started, it was yeah. still, we were meeting, we were, in the, house. we were in the house across the street and the dirt was still being churned over and he showed us the video and it was like, great. By the time that um, uh, one of the, the cohort we brought two years ago, we were, we were meeting in the building. Um, but, but the story there was one of the times we, you were hosting and uh, we were walking the neighborhood, the building was going up, it was above ground at this point. And we were walking the neighborhood and an unhoused gentleman kind of, I don't know if you remember this or not, uh, you were, you, we were just kind of talking and doing a tour and an unhoused gentleman just kind of burst in and, and, and stopped and immediately said, you like what our church is doing? That's a great church. Our church is doing great things. And I, and I asked you, is that, is that one of the folks that participate in your program? And you said, I don't, I've never seen that guy before. <laughs> but we were struck that we were 
touring the neighborhood and happenstance, an unhoused person said, that's my church, right? The community connection there that, 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 that just struck, struck me about the relevance of being engaged in the community. Yeah. Wow. I, I, I learned um, just, you know, as you were talking about the, the trees <laughs> and that the trees share resource. Mm -hmm. I, the, the image of that is just so powerful and the ability and, and the ability and the connection of the seminary being that which seeds trees mm -hmm. and seeds other and the, the, the opportunities that a seminary has for me today have gone even broader mm -hmm. than perhaps I even thought about. Yeah. And, and I, thanks for saying that, Joe. There's a piece of me that wants to change the, the overriding narrative that shapes our collective imagination because that overriding narrative is this is a world where in competition for scarce resources and scarcity is the primary driver. And I think the scientist helps us see that it is the connections between us uh, that will bring flourishing of life in the local ecology. And so that just is a whole nother forming narrative that shapes our imaginations and allows us to move forward into the 21st century. Um, and, and that overriding narrative and the story we tell ourselves shapes our imagination. That's, that matters. Let me, that, that, go ahead. I'm sorry, Joe. No, no, go ahead. That same, and Libby knows this, that same researcher said that, that forests really also depend on mother trees that create the network among all the other trees. And it makes me one other, the seminary is a mother tree mm. yeah. that can nurture the trees even after they leave here, a place where people can meet and connect where wise guides and, and protégés can, can meet, even later in life. I mean, my goodness, I'm 60 and I, I could use a wise guide now. <laughs> so could you be a mother tree that, that, that nurtures the forest even after they have left? Yeah. I'm stretching the metaphor yeah, too far. I like but, it, Matt. And it's not just with our seminarians that have graduated from right, this institution, right. but within Pittsburgh itself. Um, how can the seminary convene conversations around justice if there is an issue related to justice that happens in this community? How can we convene conversations on educational matters with our civic leaders in this space um, to recognize where we are as a city on education, where we want to be and address the gap? So it's not just working with the seminarians and, and the people in this institution, but how might we be a, a convener uh, for the common good in the city of Pittsburgh? I think the seminary is well positioned for that. Which can happen um, because it's, it's happened with us in DC, the, the housing that we built mm -hmm. addresses the mayor's desire because she needs as many affordable housing units as possible, but, but, but even just the income, the, the, the average two bedroom apartment in the District of Columbia today is between 32 and $3,300 a month. A three bedroom apartment in the Beacon Center is 1500 a month and then goes down. And so the miracles that we can do when we, when we put all of our resources together can create situations in people's lives where, where they can not be oppressed, not be marginalized, but can be in situations where we can be whole. I want to name that um, I hope those who are connected to PTS board members, faculty, staff, that the language that was just stated here is exactly what we've been doing. Mm. We have been the mother tree through our continuing ed programs, through the various events that we've had, had here, uh, even remotely. The, the, and so that affirms the journey we've been on already. And I think uh, that's worth celebrating, but now leaning into it even more, right? And it, it tells us that we've been the place that has nurtured so many people. As I've journeyed and listened to those who have had connections with this seminary, uh, they speak about a nurturing, an alma mater, a nurturing mother, right? They speak about the, the value of, of coming back here and sort of experiencing this. So, Hear these, hear these words particularly as affirmation of what we've been doing. And the question then becomes, how can we do more of that? That's a, that's that, that, thank you for, for that in particular, because that's an important thing for us uh, to remember. It, you know, um, we've, this day has been full of sort of change and excitement and, 
and yeah, the, the, the guy that's the, the signaling the change is saying, stay the course in some respect, fish differently, but also lean into what we've been doing. And I think that's the balance that we have as a seminary is to both figure out what's happening, but maintain our nurturing mother status of helping people to be uh, nourished when they come here. Let me take a moment to now open the floor for, for folks. And Derek, can I get your assistance in, in uh, passing the mic? Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I just turned it. Uh, Dr. Daniels, um, I'd like to ask you two questions. One is whenever you endeavored to under, you know, to undertake this project, what were the, you know, what were the um, sort of human resource shortages within your house? And the second question is clearly your standing allowed you to engage with stakeholders to orchestrate this. And how has your standing changed looking forward now that you've accomplished this? So uh, our congregation is a working class congregation, but it's amazing that when we do the one-on-one -on -one relational meeting, meetings in our congregation, how we realized we have incredible assets that we didn't know we had. Mm -hmm. um, we had set up a, a separate 501c3 community development corporation 20 years ago out of our congregation uh, because we sensed that there would be issues we would need to deal with, not knowing that this project was coming. Um, the head of that organization is a member of our church who's a CPA, now retired. Uh, we put our nonprofit together with her and two lawyers who joined our church because they saw that we were community minded and wanted to be a part of a community minded church in the neighborhood where they lived. Um, there, the three of them are still present. Um, from a human resource point of view further than that, um, <laughs> we connected with people in the three sectors that, that I talked about because within our congregation, the assets that we leaned on were people who took on second and third jobs to meet their pledges to this project because they believed in it. We raised as a congregation, um, a working class congregation, $1.4 million. And so we took our 1.4 million and we took our property and we went to the mayor and to government officials and said, we have a common problem here and we wanna be a part of the solution. Will you play ball? And they said, yes. And uh, we had forces in the, in the community that sought to kill it. Um, our property sits next to a federal, federal fort, which is the only fort that a sitting president visited during Lord, wartime, that was Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and uh, instead of seeing our project enhancing the fort, they fought against us. And so we had a national battle. We had columnists from the New York Times and LA Times writing columns to shoot us down. Our project died seven times and was resurrected seven times. Wow. Yeah. Okay? We've, we've, look, look, I, I told people, I've always believed in the resurrection. I know that God <laughs> does. Okay. And, and I would suggest that this kind of project could only happen with a long-term pastorate like Joe, it. because it's the trust and the relationships yeah. between Joe and the other civic leaders yeah. that had to be the foundation before the civic leaders would trust him to show up with yeah. integrity to the conversation. Yeah. 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 How, how has it changed my status, you, you asked? The standing of your ministry has changed because you have to personalize it, but as a congregation, you know, we're So, so our next move as a congregation is to replicate this model in other parts of the city. So we've been able to acquire some property. Uh, that's a, 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 another church property. We're able, we're, we've been able to acquire that. And we're looking at, okay, what does, what does that community need? Because that community is about two or three miles south of us. 
what, what is it that they need? Do they need affordable housing? Do they need another form of housing? Do they need another, form, another service? What do they need? We're beginning to hear that workforce housing is a necessity now in D.C. as well, which is workforce housing being uh, folks who are school teachers, firefighters who are, on, who, are, who are not, you know, on the margins per se, but they're on the edge. They can't, they're, they can't afford to live in the city either. And so they need housing, right? And kids who are checking out of the foster care programs in our cities who, if they don't have parents, they are homeless. And there is an increasing homeless population in the District of Columbia that is fueled by kids who, come, who time out of foster care and have no place to go. Now, what it has done is what we've done as a congregation has now influenced city leaders and other congregations to look at churches as places where this kind of development can possibly happen. Yeah. It has spearheaded that, uh, uh, just almost fast forwarded it in great ways. Others? Um, <laughs> thanks to all of you uh, for your for your um, incredible insights, uh, each each of which presents a, a, a diverse opinion um, that is really enriching. Um, based on uh, comments of Dr. Bloom and Dr. Davis Manning, um, and I'm hoping I can get in uh, some input from Dr. Daniels and Dr. Lee as well. Um, you know, I, I, I see the value, of course, in a, in a wise guide, right? And, and I've been fortunate to have several um, in my life. Um, and, and trying to um, square that with, with what Dr. Davis Manning said, um, you know, about uh, kind of the, the, the future focus, right, of, of the church and, and, and thinking of new ways of doing things, of course, as has been the theme of the day. How do we square those two things? How do we, how do we look to people who've been formed and shaped, uh, you know, in this old model um, and, and try and put that in a future context? So what we find is that uh, a truly wise guy doesn't, in no way wants to, you to replicate what she has been through or what he has been through. And what they're gifted in doing is helping an individual understand and, and themselves and the context that they're in now and the future that they can imagine. So oftentimes what people, when they talk about a bad mentoring relationship, it's like all I heard was his old war stories and you know that's the past and that's not where I am. And that's why this idea of a wise guide is somebody who can help you live more fully into who you can be in your future. And I, these uh, relationships with wise guides happen more serendipitously. You're in a setting, you bump into, you hear somebody saying something, you're interested in them, you go out for coffee, and then they bubble up that way. Um, so I think, at least from my perspective, that's one of the differences, is the wise guide lets you imagine, wants you to imagine your future, and draws on their experiences in a way that can be helpful to that, not anchoring you in, in, in the past. And I think it's a really interesting question. It is, it is. Because as I work with early career clergy, there's less and less of a presence of mentoring relationships in their lives. I came from a tradition where it was um, normal to have somebody in your 80s and 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s kind of Barnabasing you along, you know, kind of walking with you. And, and there is a remarkably less intentionality towards that as the acceleration of change happens. It feels to many as if um, we're in a portal and the old is gone and we're just careening towards the future. And therein is the double importance to me of having these guides in our lives to help us understand the past, help us navigate the present as we walk faithfully together in the long arc and history of God's story with, as God's people that seems really important in this moment. But, but it's a really interesting it tension. It is, it is. Yeah. I, I have a therapist, thanks be to God, okay? Um, I have, outside of my wife, I have three solid prayer partners. Um, outside of my prayer partners, I have a group of accountability brothers and sisters. And when I'm in trouble, depending on the trouble I might be in, I go to them. 
I'm not talking about legal or criminal <laughs> trouble. <laughs> so I just want to be clear. Right. All right. um, I'm talking about um, if, if I get spread too thin, if I'm working too hard, if I'm stressed out, if things start happening at the same time and it's like <sighs> time out, um, I have a network of wise guides that I can call on for any particular circumstance, and I know they'll be there for me. Yeah, and I would posit that that is a characteristic of pastors uh, who have a sustained, long tenure in ministry mm -hmm. that are still joyful mm -hmm. in ministry because of the ecology that's built around them. I can predict within number of months pastors who are no longer gonna stay in the vocation if they're not tending to that ecology around them. I, I just wanna say, but I think an, I think an authentic identity is a, pre, is a precursor of that. I, people mm -hmm. who don't know themselves where are much less, they're much more reluctant to expose themselves in any way to anybody Good because point. then they'll be exposed as the imposter that they are. And so I, I think some of the pastor isolation we see is just, I'm isolating myself because I don't want people to know how, confused and broken, I really, yeah, right, right. Great point. And, and then there's a, a virtuous cycle that happens, of course, because those sorts of people. Just a quick question, are any of those wise guides, and, and thank you for using that, are they in your church? Are any of them? Uh, many pastors are, are um, admonished not to have any close relationships with people in their church. Um, one of the things my wise guy, Uncle Pete, who didn't go to church because he, <laughs> He felt like he, he couldn't reconcile with what he saw on the street and what he saw in the church. Oh boy, yeah. But if it snowed in Pittsburgh, he'd be out there with his shovel clearing the walk so that people could go to the church, but he would never go in. But, but um, he said to me, find an elderly woman in the church who will look out for you. And so I will confide in one or two elderly women who I know are like mom to me. And I can say, hey, what do you think about this or that? Thank you for sharing. And, and then from a mentor point of view, as I agree, the mentor thing has shifted, but the opportunity to mentor is huge. And oftentimes we mentor even when we don't know. Yeah. Right. And I, I just, I just want to point out Ron Peters. Ron Peters was doing the kind of work that our church has been doing a long time ago, and I had my eye on him, okay? And he never mentored me like up close and personal per se, but he was a mentor because I saw. That's the, the exemplars you were referring to yes, earlier. I saw with what he was doing with economic and development and all here in Pittsburgh, and I was like, yeah, mm. that's it right there, okay? And, you know, never called up, say, Dr. Peters, can you tell me about, but I was looking at him, and he didn't even know, he didn't even know I was looking at him. But he was one of several people who yes. were exemplars for me. It is 4.30, so let us thank our group today. Uh, <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. That was fun. I want to uh, thank you for, for coming. Uh, thank you, Libby, Matt, and, and Joe. Let me uh, do two things. One, invite you to a brief reception downstairs uh, where you can kind of interact with them uh, directly with uh, little sweets, I guess sweets and Oh, wow, wine and cheese. Oh. I, I got to remember I'm a Presbyterian, <laughs> Presbyterian school. I got to remember that. Uh, but let me also say that, as I told you, this is, one, this is an arc of a series of conversations. The next one we're looking to have in, in sometime in the, in the uh, spring of the year, uh, uh, around the, the March uh, uh, time frame, that will uh, pose the question or seek to answer the question about what are the characteristics of good formation? And I'm excited because we're working to put together a, a from, from disciplines outside of our own that have equal uh, value in formative work. So a journalism, what does it mean to be formed in journalism? 
in law, right, and in medicine, and then again a pastoral leader. What does it look like? So stay tuned for more of that. This is, these, this is a part of the inaugural series for this, for this inaugural year of Forming Tomorrow's Clergy. So thank you for coming and uh, let's join it downstairs. <laughs>